Hi, I'm Phil Priestley and welcome to this video about cannabis. Today we're going to be talking about what cannabis actually is, where it comes from and how it's produced and a little bit about the background of cannabis as a drug. We're going to talk about how cannabis works, how it affects your brain and what the major components inside the cannabis plant are. We'll talk a little bit about the law surrounding cannabis and the illegal markets that control and supply the substance in the UK. Then I'm going to tell you about the facts. Okay about the downsides. This is the stuff that you don't hear very often, but it's really important for you to know. And this is gonna include tackling some of the false things that you might have heard in the past around cannabis as a medicinal product or something even that might be able to cure cancer. Cannabis is an organic plant as opposed to, say, MDMA, which is ecstasy, or LSD, which are made in a laboratory. So this means that cannabis is grown from seeds and it's nurtured like most plants when it's grown naturally. It wasn't invented by a guy in a science lab. But most cannabis isn't grown naturally, though. Cannabis originates from a plant that was that's divided between two strains, sativa and indica, although both are classed by the UK government as class B drug cannabis. They remain highly illegal um, and they contain different levels of psychoactive substances within them and they usually have slightly different effects on the user. Cannabis is generally a plant that grew in countries across the regions of India and Pakistan and the north of China. In terms of wild growth, it's usually associated with the West Indies and Jamaica. There are even low strength variants of cannabis growing wild in the United States, in states like Indiana, where local authorities have simply given up trying to eradicate it. Generally speaking, because cannabis is a popular drug, it's become a manufactured plant. And while it is a plant, that doesn't make it organic. Usually cannabis is grown in what the police refer to as cannabis factories. As a detective sergeant with the Cambridge Constabulary, I closed down many of these setups, which were dangerously miswired and awash with water and toxic growth chemicals. A cannabis factory is set up to look as normal as possible from the outside, like a normal house that you would walk by. But inside, the windows are blocked of all natural light. The plants are nurtured instead under UV lamps, under strict timers, and they're sprayed down with fertilizers, and each separate room will contain a different batch of plants at a different part of the growth cycle. Everything from temperature to ventilation is interfered with and adjusted. Male plants are culled and disposed of, and the female plants provide a sticky, THC-rich resin and they're encouraged to grow and to sweat. Nothing about this situation is natural, and there's a big downside to this approach too, but we need to talk about the chemicals inside the plant to in understand what this is. The two main chemicals balanced in any strain of cannabis are CBD, cannabidiol and THC, tetrahydrocannabinol. It's the THC that's the psychoactive substance in cannabis. The percentage of THC in the plant is what gives us our idea of how strong or how potent that plant actually is. CBD, on the other hand, is not a psychoactive substance. 
is actually a street legal product and many people buy it in pharmacies now because it has a calming recognized antipsychotic effect which can be used naturally for any number of reasons cbd is the crash mat or the safety belt in the cannabis ride where there is thc it is cbd that counterbalances the effect and keeps it a little bit more in check the easiest way to think about this actually is to think about chocolate Chocolate's delicious, and there are lots of different types. The most popular and commonly available form of chocolate is milk chocolate, which has a balance between milk and cocoa, but roughly 20% cocoa, maybe 30%. White chocolate is a blend that has mainly milk, of course. Dark chocolate is bitter, and it's far less sweet, and it has a huge amount of cocoa, maybe 70-90%, to 90%, very little milk. Think of the CBD as... Uh, your milk which softens the experience and THC as the active ingredient the cocoa in a legal market you've got a full choice you know exactly what you're buying and you can get what you want with consistency and reliability the price stays steady and you don't get arrested for eating chocolate of course there's no rival gangs no weapons and none of the money funds other types of crime you got that chocolate I like yeah I've got a boost I've got a Twix and I've got a Snickers. Now what is it? Make your mind up. Cannabis has a famous reputation for getting people high in this kind of soft and mellow way. It has a huge following of people who are supportive of it and claim that it enriches them in all manner of ways that generally aren't proven in science. Cannabis is a drug that was associated with the hippie movement and the peace and love generation of the 60s that gave way to a hard reg world in the 1970s when cocaine began to arrive from South America. Cannabis today does not resemble what people were smoking in the 1960s. In fact, since that time, cannabis has been getting stronger and stronger. When I first began policing in 2003, the major drug crisis centered on a heroin epidemic. It was a pretty awful time and thousands of people were destroying themselves through opiate abuse. Street cannabis was sitting at about six, seven or eight percent in strength or purity. And generally speaking, CBD content was uh, a lot higher too. And this meant that the overall potency or the strength and the impact of cannabis as a drug was far less substantial. A major study in America looked at thousands of samples of cannabis between the 1st of January 1995 and the 31st of December 2014. THC strength climbed from about 4% in 1995 to about 12% in 2014. So this increase in THC strength is not unique to Britain either. This study gives evidence that CBD levels have been falling too, but we also knew this in the UK. I'll make reference to this study uh, in the notes connected to this video. One of the major conclusions of the study is to recommend that the illegal market in cannabis has provoked an increase in the strength of cannabis, and this increase in strength poses a higher risk to users, and particularly to adolescents. So you really need to understand the THC to CBD ratio to understand what it is that you are, in the most common terms, thinking about smoking. In the cannabis market, the only supplier is organised crime. It arrives in the vast majority of circumstances through the county line's delivery route. And I'll be talking about that in a separate video. And in reality, there's no way to know about what you're getting. In all likelihood, the person selling the weed doesn't know what type of weed it is, and they don't care. They might try to reassure you that it's good, and that it's strong, and that it'll get you high. That's about it. No packaging, no government approval, no refunds. Of course, with cannabis, you do get arrested for buying it possessing it, selling it, supplying it, and so on. What we know is that high-strength cannabis is dominating the market. 
it's not even like there's a chance that you'll get that white chocolate strain or a milk chocolate experience. Generally, thanks to the cannabis factory system, the CBD has been bred out of the offer and the THC strength has been spiraling. THC in higher and higher doses becomes more psychotic. That is, it induces a psychotic experience, a psychedelic event that might include hallucinations. Hearing and seeing things that aren't real, being gripped by anxiety and paranoia, and having irrational... <laughs> It is not uncommon to now encounter cannabis on the street that contains 15% THC and above, up to including 20% or more. Newer forms and variants have been bred to create a greater impact on your brain, and versions such as Skunk, Shatter, which can have 60% or more THC, and the synthetic, i.e. the man-made simulation, Spice, which can even tip into 90%. Cannabis has taken to a new and menacing place that has nothing to do with the soft dopey high of the 1960s flower power generation. Due to the increasing levels of THC, cannabis dependency is also growing, with more and more people experiencing symptoms like insomnia, not being able to sleep, and harsh withdrawal circumstances that can include panic attacks. Most people using find that they feel okay when they are using, but feel the downside in the hangover afterward, when they feel grouchy, aggressive, and they're unable to control their impulses or their anger levels. This persuades them that the drug's fine, and the problem isn't with the drug at all. A strong urban myth has grown up around cannabis that it doesn't actually cause dependency, but we know now that it does. More and more young people are having to ask for help because they know that their habit has got out of control. Insomnia, psychosis, uh, which includes hearing voices, panic attacks for no apparent reason, mood swings between happy and angry, aggressive outbursts, failing short-term memory, uncomfortable physical symptoms like dry red eyes and increased heart rate, they're all uh, symptomatic of cannabis misuse. Paranoia is when you convince yourself that negative things are conspiring against you. People suffering with paranoia are fearful of bad things happening. They find it difficult to trust their friends and even loved ones. Stopping smoking suddenly can make these symptoms worse as the body goes into a withdrawal cycle, provoking the user to hurry back to it. Withdrawal from cannabis can last as long as two weeks and it can definitely make you feel pretty awful. For young people specifically though, cannabis contains a further hidden risk. It interferes with the healthy development of the brain. Part of the brain that is known to mature from the age of about 12 to 23 years old that helps to control and moderate behavior and deal with stress is called the prefrontal cortex. This part of the brain acts like a muscle. As it's exposed to stress, it learns how to cope with stress. As you experience these emotions through your teenage years, you get better at dealing with them. Cannabis acts like an alternative to that by shutting off those emotional experiences you temporarily feel happier, but without the cannabis, you're left unable to cope. And you start to need the cannabis to help you deal with the general emotional tests of the world around you. In the early years of school, it's common to encounter a high percentage of young people who struggle with their emotions. As the years go by, more people get better at this. A cannabis smoker who begins using in their early teenage years is likely to fall behind the development of their friends and will be showing the level of emotional controls more like a year seven or a year eight when they're hitting year 10 and year 11. When this happens, there's no quick fix. As well as not using cannabis, that emotional and psychological development has to then either catch up or it doesn't over time. A major consequence of this is that young people who have used cannabis in their early teenage years 
we'll always be tempted to go back to it because without it, for them, the world can seem harsh and hostile and it provokes anxiety and fear, which they think that the cannabis can take away. Cannabis as a drug is not the safe and reliable experience that seems to be advertised in films, in social media, in music. Very few people document the struggle that they have as a consequence of using cannabis. And because it's highlighted as a social drug, as a chill out experience, as a thing to pass around at parties, it's seen more and more to be commonplace. Likewise, a huge profit motivated movement is taking place to legalize the consumption of cannabis. This movement promises to regulate the product and our understanding of strengths and strains. It also promises to take the plant out of the hands of criminal gangs and the revenue away from other criminal activities. All of this is very good, but be advised though, this does not mean that cannabis is risk free, that cannabis is legal in the UK, it isn't, or that cannabis is something that actually benefits your health and well-being. The legal cannabis industry is worth billions in the United States and in Canada alone. The motive is definitely about profit, just as the growth of the billion dollar tobacco companies was not motivated by health or well-being either. There are a lot of myths and falsehoods that exist about cannabis and what it can do. So let's be upfront about these. It doesn't make you a more creative person, although it will tend to adjust your perception of how creative you are while you're using it. People using cannabis tend to think they're being super creative and original and that the drug has boosted their talent and made them profound. But when they come back down and look at what they created, they can see that actually it's no different to what they produced when they weren't using the drug. Cannabis cannot put into you what is not already there. If you're a creative and artistic person, there are healthier and more reliable ways to boost your creative output. As well as this, there's been huge rumors about the medicinal benefits of cannabis. In actuality, the medical applications for cannabis are usually limited to people who are suffering with chronic and long-term symptoms of ill health, and people who are dying. CBD is a recognized antipsychotic agent, but it isn't commonly used in medical practices because over time, scientists have developed a better understanding of psychosis and have produced more effective treatments. Cannabis is not a cure for cancer. It's sometimes used in the treatment of pain or as an appetite stimulant for people undergoing cancer treatment. And there are lots of companies who grow cannabis legally for medicinal uses, but none of them advertise their products as offering cancer beating properties. When confronted by such claims, faux science and urban myths, it pays to do your homework and check things out. Whether you do or don't experiment with cannabis, it does nobody any good at all to indulge the rumours and the lies that surround any drug. So let's recap. Cannabis is a plant, but that doesn't make it organic. Most cannabis in the UK has been grown in a cannabis factory under UV lights and chemical treatments. The supply of cannabis is controlled by organised crime gangs and anything that you get from crime comes with additional risks and negative consequences. There is no regulation of the supply of cannabis and you never know what you're consuming in terms of strength or purity. We do know that the market is dominated by high strength and low CBD cannabis and this is a particular risk to young people and their mental health and development. Cannabis is a drug that is surrounded by false promises. It doesn't make you more creative or artistic. It doesn't make you funnier, more popular or more attractive. It isn't a natural health benefit. It doesn't cure cancer. Cannabis does create dependency issues and it does have withdrawal consequences for people who have used it. 
It can change your, your personality in negative ways, leading to paranoia, mental health problems, issues with aggression and anger management. You can suffer terror attacks and anxiety from using it. And you can find it harder to trust the people that you love. If you're curious about the effects of cannabis and you're thinking about using it, I would strongly recommend you to talk to a trusted adult about it in a mature way. Talk to Frank at talktofrank.com is a great source of impartial and evidence-based advice about this or any type of drug. In addition, Talk to Frank offers anonymous drug counselling online every day between 2pm and 6pm. They offer an advice telephone line which is also anonymous. 0300 123 6600 and you can even text questions to 82111 and they'll reply. If you're using cannabis and you feel that your use has escalated and started to get out of hand, you can seek help. Casus can provide drug counselling and expert advice and guidance to help you reduce your use and eventually become drug free over a reasonable period of time. Casus are the NHS and in my experience of referring young people into Casus, I have found them to be incredibly knowledgeable, highly supportive and completely non-judgmental. Thanks for watching, I'll see you in the next video.